This is a Citroen DS, the most revolutionary car ever made. And coming up now on the Fastlane Car, TFL's master mechanic Ted Axe and myself are going to show you exactly why. Can you guys think of any other cars you can drive on three wheels? Well, I can't, but you can with the Citroen DS. We talk a lot about driving them on three wheels. We're gonna prove it. So let's say that you're out on your road trip and you have a flat and you don't have a spare. This is to demonstrate that if you really don't have a functional spare, you can still get yourself home. To be fair, the three wheels you should drive on are the driver's side rear and both fronts both fronts because it's front wheel drive. You won't go anywhere with only wheel, one wheel there. And of course, doing you, you know keeping your missing wheel is away from the driver just helps with your weight bias. After loosening all the lug nuts while the car is good and solid, you can take your adjustable stand and it hooks under a peg on the frame, if you can call it a frame. You run the car up to its full height, which I think we're there now. It's that same hubcap removal tool now slides in one of these holes. Make sure that stays, and now we lower the car, and it will pick up both wheels on this side, most importantly, the one we want to change. At number nine, we have this little lever that controls the fully adjustable self-leveling hydropneumatic suspension that allows you to raise the suspension, lower the suspension if you want to like Ford Streams. So the suspension is the thing that makes the cars more famous than anything else. Everybody knows about the suspension. Oh, that's the goofy car that goes up and down. The Citroen uses pressurized nitrogen spheres with hydraulic fluid on a, the equivalent of a bottle jack acting on them for the, for the spring at a lever down here. This position marked at the very large, with the, with the large black bar, that's your ride height. That's your standard smoothest ride going down the road, the normal ride height. There are two intermediate positions that raise the car up nominally and still maintain some form of suspension. And then if you go all the way to the very top, that's for changing a tire. You go all the way down to the very bottom and lock there, the car will sink all the way down. For example, on most cars, if you needed to, say, change your springs and shocks, you could spend Depending on the complexity of the car, seized bolts, things like that, it can be a time-consuming process. On the Citroen, you lower it to here, open the hood, spin off each sphere like an oil filter, and put a new one on, and you're done. There's your springs and shocks all at once. It's a Hemi just like that old famous Hellcat. Perhaps a little bit less powerful, but the Citroen DS does have a hemispherical head. It's a Hemi, yes. It's a Hemi, simply meaning hemispherical combustion chambers, of course. It looks, to, you know, if, if we had two more cylinders at a glance, it would look like an E-type Jaguar. It is mounted, is the word longitudinally, so it's a front-wheel drive car, but it's not modern front-wheel drives. It's sideways, right? You know, your spark plugs are facing you. Um, this is longitudinally mounted with a transaxle ahead of it. So your transaxle is the furthest forward in the car. The radiator sits on top of it. It's very reliable. 200,000 miles is easy with care. Um, and there's great torque. There's, there's good enough power. With the aerodynamics, high speeds were easy. It's just that you weren't going to win any stop sign Grand Prix. Do you know how many they built? Uh, roughly one and a half million. So of right. And I think they lost money on every one. It was the Citroen 2CV that, that really kept the financial. And it, it's, as expensive as they were, the, the cost of all this beautiful construction was so high. Uh, the first one was 1955, although really it, it was, would have been 1956 before anybody was actually putting the key in one and taking it home. And uh, last year it was 76, and they gave up selling them to us in 72. This car has probably one of the best rides ever. It's like riding on a cloud. In fact, it's so good many film production agencies throughout the years have used these as film cars. Charles de Gaulle, okay, 
say he credits the Citroen suspension for saving his life. And uh, uh, he was ambushed and you know a spattering of machine guns came into his car when he was riding in it and uh, shot out all the tires and the chauffeur was able to drive the guy to safety in spite of having four flat tires. Um, everybody, including De Gaulle, I think, credits the hydro pneumatic suspension. So you can have a flat tire in this car and not know it till you smell it. I've actually had a blowout on the front wheel at 80 miles an hour in my wagon. And this was coming back from Glenwood Springs and I'm like, car feels a little funny, I smell something. Thump, 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 thump. The tire was just toast and, and because of the, I think it's really more about the geometry than the hydro pneumatics that there's no sensation of danger. This car has super sophisticated headlights like a lot of modern cars today. The inside lights turn, but the outside lights also self-level. Um, the outer one is hooked with cables and bell cranks to the suspension, to the sway bars, and it will actually point up or down depending on the pitch or yaw of the car to, to self-level if you're going down the road. That way, if you accelerate hard, you're not looking up in the trees and so forth. The inner ones swivel with the front wheels, and uh, you know, a hard right turn would be, uh, and as you can see, they turn much at a much sharper angle than most of the modern ones, almost 45 degrees, or almost 90 degrees, I'm sorry. And what you can't see here is that the pivot points are such that it slightly offsets the upper and lower so that it, in a hard corner it tends to point down. The inner light will tend to point down and, and somewhat compensate for body roll. Panels on this Citroen DS are super easy to remove. In fact, this rear fender is held on by exactly one bolt. Lug wrench and single, single bolt fender removal are done with this tool. There's the single bolt. Doesn't have to be tightened very much. And then you just lift the fender. I added some mud flaps that make this unnecessarily difficult, but slide it back and lift it away, and now you've exposed the wheel. At number two, we have the brakes in the DS. They're incredibly revolutionary for the time, and there's even a gauge that tells you how long it takes to stop at any given speed. The brakes are even more amazing than people know. What I love about these cars is that the myth, the myth of the cars is less amazing than the truth of the cars, which is usually the other way around, right? But this would be the brake button. There's a little rubber thing on it, so it's the mushroom. Everybody knows about the mushroom. Your foot goes there. Um, I removed this earlier. There is no master cylinder. This distributes stored system pressure to the front and rear brakes depending on engine load and all sorts of things like that through this myriad of piping. You, you modulate the brakes by pressure, not by distance pushed. You literally are, are, you can flex your toes and change the braking effort on the car. It's that sensitive. You can see how gigantic the rotors are. These rotors are, uh, and, and even bigger, <laughs> calipers, they're, they're like out of a DC-8. Um, anyhow, the, the, the brake calipers and rotors are mounted right to the center, or right, right to the transaxle, and have giant air cooling ducts going right to them. So they're inboard, fully powered disc brakes, 1955. Triumph likes to claim first production disc brakes. <laughs> we got there first and we did it better. Number three, we actually have four words, cutting edge materials and processes. Let me have Ted explain. So this car, this is my favorite car. Unfortunately, it's miles away from being drivable. Uh, I think this car is actually significant. I think it might actually have a mildly significant history in Citroen circles, uh, very much like the Greg Long 56 DS that sat on the docks. Anyhow, part of what I love about these cars is that the engineering that nobody knows about is the innovative use of materials in, in industry breaking techniques of construction uh, and this dash is the best example it's actually plastic and unfortunately they didn't survive very well over time but this at the time was the world's largest piece of injection molded plastic and so futuristic uh, i mean it just absolutely buck rogers in a more austere way than lots of gaudy chrome and things that american cars at the time were doing and the single spoke wheel uh, fiberglass roofs were the norm Frameless glass was unheard of. Um, Citroen managed to make 
unstressed body panels and frameless door glass starting in 1955, and they don't rattle, and they don't let much air in. The turn signal trumpets, the high, the high turn signals that were a hallmark of the cars that were, I, even when I was a kid, we thought, man, that's so weird, so weird. Now it's so cool. Uh, and other manufacturers copied. This is the steering wheel. <laughs> it starts at the end you see and ends down at the rack like that. So pulling it's kind of a little bit of a process, you know, and nice bearings to support it. Now the sales literature will tell you unobstructed view of your gauges and safety. But, uh, and it is true, I mean, you sure, you're never blocked from any of your gauges, the information's great. The natural straight ahead position is about here. The number of times I have people get in my car and say, you need an alignment. And they'll tell you that it's for safety so that if you get in a crash, it'll throw you to the inside of the car. I think that's kind of, I think that's, I mean, I'm zealous about these cars, but I think that's going too far. I think the French were just being stylish. I could be wrong, but single spoke. And at number one, it has to be the Citromatic transmission in this car. It's got all the benefits of a manual transmission, but no clutch pedal. We talked about, or Tom, you mentioned the Citromatic as being the best of both worlds. Um, it's true, so it has, in when Citroen was making them, right, uh, automatics were, disrespected by most of the, you know, Americans were big on them, but for the most, for the most part of the planet was like, oh, whatever, they suck up gas, they're sludgy, they're slow, all that was true. But it was nice to not have to push a, push a clutch pedal and, and carefully match your shifts and all that sort of thing. So Citroen devised, the, starting in 1955, uh, they built their transaxle as a standard transmission with synchronizers, gears, selector forks, everything you'd expect out of a regular transmission. Uh, but on the top cover, instead of having rods that go to a lever, they have little slave cylinders, just like, like a clutch slave cylinder to operate each one individually, and a complex hydraulic valve body. Whenever you shift one of these, you have to use Star Wars references. Your uncle wanted you to have this when you're old enough, but your father wouldn't allow it, or the other way around. And then, for second gear, these aren't the droids you're looking for. For third gear, he can go about his business now. For fourth gear, move along, move along, but that gear's too high, so mash a little and downshift. This, I mean, it, can you imagine what it would cost to, to make this these days? This artificially induces, basically this one's broken, but there's a rod that comes through here, clamps to that little spool valve, and your activity is simply, here's neutral, one away from you is first, you can hear the little click, that's the artificial sensation that you're doing something. Back to neutral, there's second. One to the right is third. Another to the right is fourth. And every time you do that, you can hear it pushing the clutch in, selecting the gear, and then letting out. And you do sort of have to modulate your gas pedal, just like you do in a regular transmission, you know, because this is gonna make some of the decisions for you. The rest of it's up to you to put the, the gas pedal where you want it. Oh yeah, here's that stopping distance in road feet. I made my own dash here, but the little window in the speedometer needle goes to the number of feet that it would take you to stop on a dry road with the Michelin tires, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I emulated that from the factory original dash, which I always just thought was cool. You know, Ted, thank you so much for showing us your car. This was just incredible. It's what I live for. I hope that anybody's still awake. <laughs> and we hope you guys now agree that the car behind us, the Citroen DS, is the most revolutionary car ever made. As always, I'm Tommy. I'm Ted. We'll see you guys next time.